uh, is a map of March Madness. Now, March Madness is a couple months away, I understand. But uh, if you look closely at this map, you'll notice that only three states, uh, not counting Rhode Island, they don't count, uh, have the majority, the majority of every county completely loyal to one team. Kansas, North Carolina, and Indiana. Indiana, that's right, Indiana. Uh, if, for, if you don't know, that's where I was born and raised, Indiana. We aren't called Hoosiers for no reason. Uh, now, it's a bit of a silly il illustration, but it's an illustration of loyalty. And tonight, today's message is uh, uh, one of loyalty. Where does my loyalty lie? Uh, the sad truth uh, about this map and that word loyalty is that uh, probably one of the first things we think of when we think of loyalty has something to do with a sports team. Uh, I know that the first thing that pops into your mind is probably the Chicago Bears, Bulls, Cubs, and Blackhawks. <laughs> Who could blame you? Uh, well, this year it's been pretty embarrassing to admit loyalty to any of those teams, to be frank. And of course, there is a pretty important game for some of you this afternoon that you're looking forward to. And since I am a Bears fan, there ought to be, there should be a whole lot of this going on, okay? Uh, don't let me down. But the real question for this morning is far from our trivial loyalties to any team that we might uh, ascribe to, a, a team of players who will probably never know that I exist in my entire life. This morning we're confronted with the question of where our ultimate loyalty lies. What, or rather who, has my unquestioned full allegiance? Who is it that takes place before my children? before my spouse, before my career, before my dreams and ambitions? We're going to see these questions and this one question of loyalty answered in Jesus' message to the letter of Pergamum in Revelation chapter 2 this morning. And we see here three main points coming from the Lord's message. The first uh, has to do with the kind of allegiance that Christ commands. The second with the things that means we must reject. And finally, uh, what Jesus promises to those who belong to him. So first, we're going to see the allegiance Jesus commands. Second, the other allegiances we must reject. And finally, uh, the great benefit of our allegiance to Christ. So let's begin then with our first point this morning, and that is this. Uh, full allegiance to Christ in enemy territory. Full allegiance to Christ in enemy territory. Uh, the Lord focuses this message in Pergamum in terms of loyalty and allegiance amongst competing religious and ruling authorities. Uh, let's look at both of these realities in a little bit more detail, both that they are in enemy territory and that there's full allegiance required. We'll start uh, really where Jesus starts in addressing the church when he tells them, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. This same idea is repeated at the end of verse 13 when he also says, your city where Satan lives. Simply put, Jesus is telling the church in Pergamum a truth which applies uniquely to them, but is also true broadly of all churches. Uh, he is acknowledging that Christians live in enemy territory. Christians live in enemy territory. This was uh, true in a unique way to the church in Pergamum. Pergamum, a little background on this city. Uh, here's a model of the city. Uh, it was a, considered a, a religious center of Asia Minor, uh, certainly, but also really was known throughout the empire as such. Uh, Pergamum was home to some of Rome's uh, greatest temples. The most impressive temple was that of Zeus, which you can see kind of in the middle of your picture there, surrounded by white. And here's a closer uh, look at this temple to Zeus, which uh, has been partially recreated in Berlin, to give you some perspective there. That's uh, pretty impressive. Uh, what's even more interesting is that one of the temples uh, in this city was dedicated to the pagan god Asclepius, who was said to have healing powers, and uh, people from all over the empire would come there to get healed, and whose idol was in the form of a serpent. In fact, this temple and idol were so popular in Pergamum that a serpent became the emblem of the city as evidenced on this coin that they excavated from Pergamum. Uh, 
This may be why Jesus emphasizes Pergamum as a city where Satan lives and where he has his throne. However, we should also note that scholars uh, are, are noting that by the time of the first century, the worship of the old Greek gods was really declining and had been uh, almost entirely replaced by the worship of Caesar uh, as the supreme above all other gods. Uh, thus, while the religious background of the city certainly has something to do with Jesus' emphasis, uh, Satan here is in the singular and likely uh, referred more direct directly to you know, Caesar worship. Uh, before any of these other Greek deities. And if referring to Caesar, of course, uh, he only stands as a representative of Satan himself and his rule. Now, we might look at Pergamum and the first century in general with all these weird idols and, and temples and everything else uh, and, and think, wow, what a backwards time they lived in. I mean, what a bunch of weird pagans. I'm certainly glad I don't live then. But it's certainly not just Pergamum that can be described as a place where Satan's throne is. Christians have always existed in enemy territory. Ephesians 2 tells us this. As for you, all of us, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in, the, in those who are disobedient. All mankind, wherever they live, is following the ruler of the kingdom of the air. And this is Satan. Until Christ returns to establish the Father's kingdom upon the earth, finally and completely, the world is under the temporary rule of Satan and those who represent him. This does not mean God is not sovereign. He is. This does not mean that Jesus Christ has not ascended to the throne uh, on high. He has. But it does mean that God has allowed the world to be given over to its own transgressions and sins to follow Satan in disobedience to God. Without anyone having to become a Satanist, uh, all the world is satanic. You, even you and I, from the moment of our birth, uh, we're following after the ways of Satan and we're rebels against God, perhaps without knowing it. Uh, we're giving our allegiance to the great enemy of God and following after him. At bottom, this is what being satanic boils down to. It's the rebellion of Adam and Eve in the garden, choosing to eat the fruit that Satan told them would be good and that God told them was sin. Since that moment, all mankind is allied with Satan and is in rebellion against the creator. This is the world we live in. This is the allegiance Christians repent of and that Christ brings us out of. The Satanism of the world is not surprising, though. After all, we were a part of it. But it does mean that Christians, uh, if they trust in Christ, now live in enemy territory. Every moment is a moment where Satan and the world will be luring the Christian away from Christ. Every moment, Satan and the world will fight against the Christian. Satan and his throne is the primary enemy of Christ and sets up a one-on-one -on -one confrontation between two powers who both demand full allegiance. And this is what being a Christian means. It means full allegiance to Christ in enemy territory. This is exactly what Christ is calling us to when he tells us to believe in him, when he tells us to follow me, that the Lord Jesus Christ is really commanding full allegiance from us. The Lord Jesus Christ commands full allegiance. We see this in our passage, first when Jesus says to the church, yet you remain true to my name. This phrase, remain true, uh, translates one Greek word which is repeated negatively uh, in verses 14 and 15 and is translated there as hold to, holding to these pagan teachings uh, in those verses. I think this is an intentional repetition of the same word to contrast holding on to Christ versus holding on to the teachings of this world. Uh, the term can also mean hold fast, and as uh, Bauer's Greek Dictionary elaborates, it carries the idea of remaining closely united. Thus, and especially with this contrast we've already seen between Satan and the Lord, 
I think Jesus is clearly saying here that one must uh, remain true. One must hold fast to Christ alone. Further evidence of this idea uh, of full allegiance to Christ is present in the very next phrase, where Christ says, you did not renounce your faith in me. And this word for renounce can also mean deny. It can also mean disown. And very clearly, it presents for us a black and white decision uh, of following Christ or following Satan. Uh, This is no mere metaphor either. Uh, It seems that in their own city, the governing authorities had presented this very question of allegiance to Antipas. He did not renounce Christ, but gave full allegiance and was put to death, apparently in their own city, executed because he would not give full allegiance to the worship of Caesar. And, there's, and thus Satan. If you dig a, a, just a little bit more into this name, uh, Antipas, you'll see that it's a, a simple Greek name that means against all, anti-against, pas all. Uh, some take this as a figurative representation of all martyrs, um, but I think this refers to a real person who was really martyred for his faith in Pergamum. His name is certainly not a common one, and This is speculation, but perhaps uh, this is the Christian name that this man was given when he trusted in Christ, much like Cephas was given the name Peter. Perhaps, especially in the eyes of those of Pergamum, to be a Christian really meant to be against all. It certainly seems to be the idea that Jesus is presenting to his church that you must not renounce your faith, but you must remain true to my name. And this means being against all other claims to divine authority, all other claims of truth and opposition to Christ, all others who would demand your full allegiance. Jesus Christ is the name above all names, and as we saw last week, he is the first and the last. And you cannot be partially allied with the first and the last. You cannot be partially allied with Christ the Lord as Jesus himself says to us in Matthew chapter 12, he who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Jesus cannot be an addition to anyone's life. He's Lord of your life. You cannot adopt some of his teachings and view him as one good moral teacher among many others. You you can't even adopt him as the greatest moral teacher that's ever lived. No, he's much more than that. He is a Lord, and he must have full allegiance as Lord. We can't squeeze him into our lives when things are rough and we need a, a friend to call, so we call Jesus. Jesus is not your homeboy or your buddy, and it's nowhere near enough to sing along with the Doobie Brothers that Jesus is just all right with me. Jesus is just all right. Oh, yeah. Just all right? Homeboy, what irreverence for the King of kings, for the Lord of lords. It's certainly fine to call Jesus friend. He himself tells us to do this in John 15. Greater love is no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. But just remember that your friend is the first and the last. And your friend holds a sharp, two-edged sword. And later he threatens to fight against those who treat him as less than king with that sword. And perhaps C.S. Lewis was onto something when he presented Jesus as Aslan in Narnia. When Beaver is explaining that Aslan is a lion for the first time to Susan, uh, he says this, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. In Narnia, his followers, uh, they don't say, Jesus is just all right with me. They say, hail Aslan. All hail Aslan. They don't say Aslan is my homeboy. They don't say Aslan is my buddy. Christians must declare much more than Jesus is my friend. 
No, we, we bend the knee and we declare, all hail Jesus. Glory be to the Lord. I worship the only true King. The Lord Jesus Christ commands full allegiance. And this allegiance will be tested and it will make us a people like Antipas who, who are against all, it seems, and who are in enemy territory. But what are some practical ways we can apply and live out our full allegiance to Christ? And apart from declaring it and, and shouting about it and teaching it, apart from just saying we are on his side, what else does it mean? Well, this is where Christ turns in the next verses, 14 through 16, and he says namely this, that full allegiance to Christ requires rejecting all opposition. Full allegiance to Christ requires rejecting all opposition. Jesus calls on some in the church in Pergamum to repent in verse 16. And this repentance is made explicit in verses 14 through 15, and we can summarize it by saying this, first of all, that Jesus is saying repent by rejecting every teaching and every practice opposed to Christ. Repent by rejecting every teaching and every practice opposed to Christ. Uh, Jesus points out to the church uh, that there are a few things that he does hold against them. Even though many, perhaps most in the church, are like Antipas and, and did remain true to his name, there are apparently some others uh, who hold to the teaching of Balaam and who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Uh, there are two things, I think, to point out here that help clarify what exactly Jesus is exposing uh, by saying this. First, I think by contrasting these people with verse 13, those who were holding fast to Christ, uh, that Jesus is not referring to everyone in the church in Pergamum here. He's referring to some of the church. You, you have people there. Moreover, even though he's writing this message to the church, uh, I think he's clearly exposing that these people within the church are not truly believers. They may say they are aligned with Christ, but they live, uh, uh, they have either uh, renounced their faith completely or their current practice demonstrates that they never really truly believed Christ as Lord. Thus, they are as opposed to others uh, renouncing Christ uh, when they hold to the teaching of Balaam and the teaching of the Nicolaitans here. So we're talking about a group within the church. We also, though, uh, need to look at this, this teaching of Balaam in particular, which helps clarify this a little bit for us. And it's probably not a reference to the actual teaching that they held, but a figurative comparison of that teaching to the Old Testament teaching of Balaam, who led Israel into the idolatry of uh, Baal worship or Baal worship. This becomes more obvious when we read how it's described in the book of Numbers. Numbers 25 says this, while Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women who invited them to the sacrifices of their gods and the people ate and bowed down before these gods. So Israel joined in worshiping the Baal of Peor and the Lord's anger burned against them. Notice that the emphasis of this passage is on the fact that the people of Israel were led away from Yahweh to worship other gods. The exact same emphasis is found later in Numbers, which looks back on this event in Numbers 25, uh, when it says this, they were the ones who followed Balaam's advice, Balaam's teaching, and were the means of turning the Israelites away from the Lord. This sounds nearly identical to what Jesus says back in Revelation chapter 2 about this teaching. Uh, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Again, the main idea here is that people turned away from Yahweh and toward idol worship. The practices of, of eating food sacrificed to idols and sexual immorality were wrong in and of themselves, but in this church, they were tied to actual idol worship as well. Thus, Jesus is demonstrating that some of these supposed Christians are really no true believers at all. And he's questioning their allegiance. Jesus is repeating the idea that true faith and worship of him demands full allegiance. And it cannot be a mere worship of Jesus as one God among many others or as one set of divine teachings among many others. This is, in fact, idolatry. 
Believing in Jesus means believing in the one and only true God who is Father, Son, and Spirit, that there is no other. It also means believing the Word of God, uh, of this God, is the only divine authoritative revelation that we have, that his teaching is the only divine Word of God. The teaching of Balaam brings the teaching of Jesus down to the level of other pagan false deities, down to the level of Caesar. But true faith in Jesus requires rejecting all of this. In other words, believing in Jesus means rejecting every teaching and every practice opposed to full allegiance to Christ as Lord and as the only Lord and the only Savior. The earliest records we have of baptism services that were done uh, outside of the Bible, uh, they all include some kind of renunciation of Satan. Uh, And it was along the lines of something like this, uh, I renounce thee, Satan, and all thy pomp and all thy works. This is one of many things you you would say at a baptism service uh, beyond just our, you know, do you believe in Jesus? Yes. They would actually stand up in front of everybody and say, I renounce thee, Satan, and all thy pomp and all thy works. Which means I renounce all idolatry and I renounce every work that Satan puts up against my Lord and Savior. So the question for us then is, where might I have partial allegiance to Christ? It's not enough to reject one bad teaching of idolatry, but all teachings of idolatry. It's not enough to reject one practice that clearly the Bible is against, but all practices that the Bible is clearly against. Thus, I I cannot be proud about my denial of abortion and at the same time say it doesn't really matter if you're Catholic or Jehovah's Witness or Mormon. I cannot be a staunch advocate of the eternal life that we have alone in Jesus Christ, but then say that it doesn't really matter what you believe about God's nature. I can't shout about the breakdown of the family and the perversion of gender in our society and then not be zealous for the inspiration of Scripture. Full allegiance to Christ in all areas of life and practice is what he is after. And this is not about areas that are fringe issues or are debated within a gospel-believing church. These are foundational issues. These are orthodox issues that define the truth of God, that define his gospel, that define ourselves and how we are meant to live. And if I haven't really given him praise like this, I haven't really given him my belief like this, that he is the only Lord and Savior. Perhaps I need to ask myself if I've really ever believed. Maybe if you feel the Lord stirring in your heart this morning, to say, yes, I I must confess Christ is my Savior, my Lord. He is the only one. Then repent. Repent. Reject every other so-called religious teaching, every other so-called practice of spirituality, and put your faith in Christ and Christ alone. Repent by rejecting every teaching and every practice that's opposed to Christ. Now, if some of these people did not repent, the consequence was severe, and it was further proof that Jesus does not consider them true believers. Christ is coming as Lord to declare war and to declare war against all who oppose him. Christ is coming as Lord to declare war against all who oppose him. Jesus says in verse 16, Repent, therefore, Otherwise, I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. First thing to to note about this warning is this word fight, uh, translated fight in the NIV. As shocking as it is, uh, as it is translated here, to think of Jesus fighting against you, uh, it's actually much more significant than even that. It's a much harsher uh, word. It's used uh, in the context of battle and it literally means to make war, to declare war. 
Jesus is not just saying he will rough up those who oppose him or, or even saying to Christians that he will discipline them. No, he's saying he will declare war and fight to the death those who oppose him. Jesus is threatening his wrath here. This makes it even more clear that he's not speaking to true believers who have been forgiven and made a part of God's kingdom, but false believers within the community of the church. It's also evidenced by the pronoun them. Jesus does not say he will wage war with you, referring to the entire church, uh, but that he will wage war with them, referring to a group within the church. Uh, that are wolves among the sheep. And in case you think I'm making too much of this passage, please note that Jesus is coming to fight them with the sword of my mouth. This is the same sword that he used to describe himself at the beginning of the message to Pergamum, that uh, Jesus is the one who holds the sharp, double-edged sword. And the only other place, the only other place where both the term fight and the term make war Uh, appear in the New Testament, and it's also the only other place where the term fight or make war is described of Jesus is at the end of Revelation in Revelation chapter 19, and I think this is exactly what Christ means. We're going to read that together, verses 11 through 21. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God, so that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty men of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, And their armies gathered together to make war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who had performed the miraculous signs on his behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped his image, much like Caesar. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. The rest of them were killed with a sword that came out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. And all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. This is not a frail Jesus. This is not a hippie Jesus. This is not a make peace, not war, can't we all just get along Jesus that you may have heard others talk about. This is the God who will zealously and violently rid his world of every trace of evil. He's the righteous king. He is not safe but he is good, and he will return to make righteousness and justice and good prevail. This is exactly, though, what I think we have a hard time understanding and accepting about God. Many Christians today are embarrassed, uh, repulsed, ashamed of these kinds of passages. I want to avoid them at all costs. And truth be told, we might admit we're embarrassed by these kinds of passages. We're embarrassed by this Jesus. These are the scriptures that, you know, we instinctively want to hide and hope our non-Christian friends don't read and come asking us questions about. But it's here where we run into the exact same danger as the teaching of Balaam or the teaching of the Nicolaitans or anything else. It's idolatry. Idolatry happens the moment we avoid any talk of God and of his wrath in the Bible that the Bible clearly teaches. When we never read and reflect on these passages that we've read this morning, 
when we read only the New Testament or go back to the Old only for Psalms and Proverbs. When a Christian does this, she's really saying that she doesn't like Jesus in Revelation 19. She doesn't like Jesus of Revelation chapter 2. In her mind, maybe not out of her mouth, but in her mind, those portions of the Bible might as well uh, be ripped from the binding. The binding. Those descriptions of God are, might as well be replaced with something more fitting. And if you think that you don't have any kind of temptation to this kind of thinking about God, ask yourself the question, you know, when was the last time that you told your unchristian friends that the God that you worship, the God you adore, the Jesus that you sing, oh, what a friend we have in Jesus about, is the Jesus of Revelation 19. So, what do you do with the Jesus of wrath and revelation? Do you, do you adore him? Are, are you drawn to him? Do you find him lovely? Or do you find him repulsive? Do you find him embarrassing? Do you love him? What it means to be Christian is to not allow yourself to determine your own concept of God. You must let God tell you who he is, and then the only response is to bow before him in faith. We cannot separate the Son of God from Revelation 19 from the baby Jesus of Matthew chapter 1. And certainly, if these passages are true, if Jesus really is warning everyone and anyone, whether she calls herself a Christian or not, whether she goes to church or not, if he's really truly warning anyone and everyone that he's coming to wage war to all who oppose him, who are we to hide these passages? What must we do but warn others? We must not hide passages like this, for we are hiding the most important warning anyone could ever hear. So I say again, Jesus is coming, and he is coming in awful wrath. He's coming with final judgment, and he is coming to make war against all who oppose him. You won't be able to stand then. None of us can. So Christian, don't simply point to the Jesus uh, in a manger or the Jesus who is a friend. Point them to Jesus who is Lord, who is King, and who will rule. Point them to a Savior that makes us all very aware that we are desperate for his mercy. If you're not a Christian this morning, repent. Bow the knee. Confess Christ is your Lord and your Savior. And know that the guilt of your rebellion against him as the guilt of the rest of us is wiped clean and is cleansed by the mercy of Christ. And you can know that his war will not be waged against you. But do not, do not stand against him. Christ is coming as Lord to declare war against all who oppose him. And therefore, we must repent by rejecting every teaching and every practice that is opposed to Christ. Christ is, is Lord, and that commands our full allegiance, even though we are in enemy territory and may be against all, like Antipas. As serious and as heavy as this message of warning has been, and it is serious, the, the message of hope is equally sweet, and we must not miss it. For those who give allegiance to Christ belong to Christ forever. Those who give allegiance to Christ now belong to Christ forever. Jesus ends this message by saying, To him who overcomes, 
I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. The meaning of, of these two things, this hidden manna and white stone, uh, is honestly a bit mysterious. We may just have to wait till we get them one day or see that they're just kind of a figure of speech. Uh, as uh, Dr. Michael Spiegel uh, tweeted recently, he said, uh, I have almost no clue what this white stone thing is in Revelation 2.17, but I want one. You know, doctorate degree professors get just as confused as the rest of us sometimes. Uh, I do think that there is, though, some significance to the white stone, which we can know at least in part now, and I think is made somewhat evident in the passage. Uh, the only other passage in the New Testament that uses this word or describes this stone is in Acts 26, and there it, it refers to a voting stone. That's really all we have to go on in the New Testament. But other commentators point to other passages outside the Bible, other uses that connect it to a magical amulet. They connect it to a token of Roman hospitality. Uh, they connect it to even a ticket to the Roman uh, gladiator games, which might indicate martyrdom in this passage. But there's really just not enough evidence to go on to decide exactly what the stone is. But there is a clue which lets us know the significance of the stone, and it's in how it's described, that the stone uh, has a, a name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Now, this we can have a little bit more certainty about. Whatever the stone is, it's a gift from Jesus, the Lord himself, and it identifies the recipient with him. It indicates being accepted by God, named by him with a special name known only to God and only to you. And I think here it is meant to signify what we know of those who trust in Christ, that we belong to him that we belong to him, and we belong to him forever. Those who receive this stone have, have no fear of his coming judgment. They, they have every expectation of future victory with him. But how can we know? How can I know that I get one of these things? How can I know that I belong to Christ and I am not at odds with him when he comes? After all, we've already admitted we all have rebellious hearts. We already admitted that we are all satanic at heart. We've already all admitted that we're all sons and daughters of our parents, Adam and Eve. And if belonging to Christ rests on my ability to give Christ my full allegiance every day, then I am doomed. I am doomed. If it's all on me, I'm doomed. But we know we belong because of Jesus, because he's the one that gives us the stone, because he's the one that secured our position. He's already come once to wage war, but a different kind of war, a war against my sin, a war against my guilt, a war against my judgment, and he already won that war. He won that war on the cross when he became a worthy substitute, bearing the wrath of my sin, my judgment, my penalty. As we've already read and want to read again in Revelation chapter 5, which says, The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He's able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, and they sang a new song, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. This is why we know we belong to him. Because through faith in Christ, I am his own. Through faith in his cross, in his victory, in the lamb who triumphed, for me, I know all of my sins have been forgiven. All of my guilt has been vanquished. And Satan has no hold on me anymore. I am his own. We give our full allegiance to Christ, uh, even in enemy territory, and doing that means that we are rejecting every other teaching and, and every other opposition to Christ, every other practice, knowing that Christ is coming 
and he's coming as a warrior king. But we also know that those who give allegiance to Christ now belong to him and belong to him forever. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, forgive me for the countless times that I've treated you as so much less than you are. I've dumbed you down to my level or to the level of something I understand or something I want. Lord Jesus, I, I have looked at you as less than Lord. Nonetheless, Lord, you still came to die for me, to die for me, to take the guilt that I should endure on my account, that I should be warred against, and you took it away. You nailed it to a cross, your cross. You gave me every hope and expectation that I belong to you, that I'm on your side, that I'm your own. Lord Jesus, I pray for everyone in this room this morning. All of us would confess, whether it's the first time or whether it's uh, the millionth time, confess in our hearts, Lord Jesus, you are my Lord. Lord Jesus, you are my Savior. All hail King Jesus. Amen.